Statistics. Confidence interval when standard deviation of population is known. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get realistic, we need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever, because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. One note presentation section 1956 confidence interval when standard deviation of population is known tab. Looking at a scenario similar to recent scenarios where we're trying to find information about a large population, but we can't test every item within the population because there's just too many of them. Therefore, we're gonna be taking a sample from the population, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. Two general techniques for doing this, one being hypothesis testing, the second being confidence intervals. Hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where we think we know what the middle point is, such as, for example, if it says on average there are so many peanuts in the bags of peanuts, we can build, in essence, our curve around that center point, the hypothesis, and then when we have our samples, we can see if the sample is far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis. Confidence intervals lend themselves to situations where we don't know what that middle point is, and therefore the sample that we take, the results will be basically our middle point, which we will then create a confidence interval around in some way, shape, or form. Now, you could still think of it in terms of hypothesis testing, saying, hey, look, if I got this number as the center point, I could imagine a hypothesis test. What if, for example, this number out here was the actual middle point of the population? Would the result I got be far enough away for me to reject the hypothesis given that number as the hypothesis? And I could repeat that process over and over again until I get an interval of uh, what would and what would and would not be rejected, basically having a peak to peak kind of interval. However, it would be easier if we can basically build a curve around the center point. So we take our sample, we have the middle point, we would like to make, in essence, a bell curve around it. If we can't make a bell curve with a normal distribution, possibly we could use T distributions, which we'll basically talk about later to get our interval. So that's what we will be in essence doing this time, looking at confidence intervals with a Z distributions, meaning we're gonna be looking at basically a normal distribution situation. All right, confidence intervals. So we're gonna then say that, what is the average cost of a job? So we're gonna imagine a job like building a deck, let's say a construction job or something like that. And we're trying to say, okay, what is the mean or average price uh, of doing the job. So we want to create a confidence interval. We want to have a 95% uh, confidence, which is kind of like a standard uh, confidence level, oftentimes basically the default confidence level, noting that that does mean that 5% of the time, just in terms of random chance, the actual amount might lie outside of that interval. And we'll actually test that out here so that we can get a better conceptual understanding of what that means. The standard deviation of the population we're gonna imagine is known at 202. Now note that if the standard deviation is known, it's more likely that we can use a normal distribution as opposed to T distributions. If we're doing confidence intervals and we don't know the mean and or the standard deviation, then we might have to use the T distributions rather than normal distributions, which is a similar process, but the, the bell-shaped curves are gonna have a little bit fatter of tails on them requiring a larger confidence interval 
which would make sense if we have a little less information. You'd, you'd think you'd want a larger interval. This is going to be our formula uh, to help us to get the, the uh, range. Remember, when we have a similar kind of scenario with our data in that we can think of the standard deviation of the population, which we may or may not know. We know this time the standard deviation of the sample might tend towards the standard deviation of the population. But even if the population was not bell-shaped curved, we would like uh, to be able to use a bell-shaped curve. And therefore, we're going to be thinking about the idea of us taking every possible combination using the central limit theorem of whatever sample size and if we take the average of those numbers, that will tend towards a bell-shaped curve, which is going to be our confidence interval, which is this bit, uh, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of uh, n. Okay, and then this is going to give us, and that's this is the same bit here, this is going to give us a range, which we'll talk about later. And this second part of the formula over here, you, you remember that we can oftentimes drop it off if the population n big N is large enough and just use the simple part of the formula. Now, what we're first going to do if we were to build this in Excel is do the behind the scene things first, meaning this is what we kind of know. Like if you're watching a movie, this is like what we know as the viewer of the movie, but what is not known in universe by the people acting in the movie. That being for us, the actual characteristics of the actual population. And then we're going to imagine we don't know this and then do the sample to see if our sample corresponds to the actual population. So if we were to generate this, say, in Excel, we can mirror this problem, and we have another course or section if you want to generate them in Excel, which, of course, is a little bit longer of uh, presentations as we do Excel formatting. But we're going to basically build a randomly generated set of numbers with a population mean around the 822 and the standard deviation of the population around the 203. And it's going to be somewhat random, but the numbers should be distributed in somewhat of a bell-shaped curve around that middle point. We do this with a data analysis in Excel, which you would have to turn on uh, if you want to use that uh, in Excel, which you can look up how to do in multiple locations, possibly using like ChatGTP these days uh, can help you with that. Now, if I took this data and then I made... I graphed it in terms of a histogram, you can see it's somewhat bell-shaped. Now, even if it wasn't bell-shaped data, we might still be able to use the central limit theorem because if I took all combinations of samples, then we could still use characteristics of a bell-shaped curve. But you would expect this data when we're talking about the average price of a deck to make something or a construction problem process, if the constructions are similar in nature, that it would tend towards a central point uh, and, and that would be the nature of the data you would expect. Okay, so then I could then say, all right, well then let's take the mean of the population. So if I take the average of all this, adding them up and divided by the number that we came to, we should come up to something around 822, but it might not be exact. We actually come out to 826 because of the randomness of the sample. Standard deviation, if I take the standard deviation of the actual population, these numbers, then I should get something close to the 203, and the actual number is 201. So this is going to be the number that we're going to assume that we know now in our problem for the standard deviation of the population uh, when we do our confidence intervals. That's going to be our idea. All right. So then we can do we can generate our our sample so what i'm going to do to generate the sample if we had this as our actual population then we would have to do some kind of random sample to take part of those now obviously in practice all we would have would be the sample we would want to choose some kind of randomness to pick the sample and this if this was done in excel you could select like the top bit the top 300 if our sample size is 300 because these numbers were randomly generated. Or you could put a random number generation next to this and shuffle them using the random generation. Or we could use, as we did here, an index function, which basically says, I want you to take this column of numbers and then choose randomly between uh, one and 3,000. And there are 3,000 rows in that set of numbers if I copied them all over, which I did not. And that would give us 
a random set of numbers from the list of numbers that we have generated. So this is going to be our sample. This is what we know in universe. This is all we know. We don't have all of the data we're going to imagine of the entire population. And this is what we're going to be working with then. All right. So the sample, how big is the sample? We could do a count function counting these. If we copied all of them over, we're going to say the sample size is 300. That will be a little n. X bar. This is going to be the mean. Now, remember, you could you could think about the mean of the actual population, which we're, we imagine we might not know. We could think about the mean of the sample. And then we could think about the mean as though we took every combination of sample size 300 out of the population, in our case, of 3,000. All of those means should tend towards the same central point, which is the mean of the population. So this mean of the sample is going to tend towards that center point, the mean of the population. We'll call it X bar. The STP, standard deviation of the population, then uh, was given to us, right? So we know that that was this number. We took, we could take the standard deviation of the sample and it might tend towards the standard deviation. By the way, this is the average of these numbers. This might tend towards the standard deviation of the population if we took the standard deviation of the sample. Uh, but uh, if we have the standard deviation of the population, we would use that. If we don't have it, then might, maybe we would have to switch to T distributions instead of normal distributions to have the bell-shaped curve with the wider tails on it, which we might take a look at in more detail uh, later. So you will recall, like with the mean, it's more important with the standard deviation because the numbers could differ. We can have the standard deviation of the population, standard deviation of the sample, which might tend towards the population. And then we could have the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample size, which in our case, we chose 300 out of the population of 3000, which is a number we don't know, but are hoping that we can approximate uh, uh, my, uh, might be a number that we could use to approximate based on the information we do know with a formula. And that's going to be our standard error calculation. So now that's going to be this number. We're going to take our standard error. So we can drop the second bit. It's going to be the standard deviation of the population, which we imagine that we know this time. If we didn't, we can approximate it with the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of n, n being the sample size, in our case, 300. So if we plug that into our formula, we would take standard deviation of the population to a 1, 76, divided by the square root of n, which is 300. That gives us 11,649. Uh, this is, in essence, the standard deviation that we will use because that's the data that's going to tend towards the bell shape using the central limit theorem, even if the original data was not bell-shaped. In this case, it was kind of somewhat bell-shaped, but we're the same idea. So confidence interval, 95. That's a generic number. That's often a default number that's going to be used. That means that we want to make sure that the actual number is within our range 95% of the time, which means that even if everything goes perfectly, 5% of the time, just on random chance, you could get a number that's outside of our confidence interval. We're going to call that alpha A, which is going to be 100% minus the confidence level of 95%, 5% chance that it could be outside. Now, we have you have two sides of our of our graph over here. So if I go all the way to the right, there's a lot of information, a lot of stuff here. <laughs> then the 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 two bits in the right, so 95 in the middle. And then we have 5% outside. And because it's symmetrical, 5 divided by 2 would be 2.5 on each of the side bits here is the general layout, the general idea. Okay. So then there's a few different ways that we can get to our confidence level. Then we'll choose, we'll look at a couple different methods. So one is you can go there directly with this formula, which is a norm dot inverse formula. And this is the little instructions to help us to calculate the formula. The probability that it's looking for right here is this one, A over 2 would be that uh, 
The mean is going to be the average or X bar. That's going to be the 822 for us. And then the standard deviation it is looking for is not the standard deviation of the population, but rather the standard error. That's the one that's going to tend towards the bell-shaped curve that we're going to be using. That will get us directly to that 79917, uh, which is going to be the the lower point of our graph and then the upper point and remember what's in the middle here is going to be that 95 percent so the upper bit is going to be then the norm dot inverse and then if this was 2.5 now we're going to take one minus that 2.5 the mean is once again the middle point 822 the standard deviation is the standard error so that means that if i'm looking at my interval if I go way over here again, we're going to say our interval in the middle can be measured in terms of standard deviations where zero would be the Z of zero. And then we can go standard deviations up and back. And then we also can measure it in terms of X's. This is the middle point or the mean or average. And now we're taking the range up and back to, to list out our range. All right. So then if I go back on over and go... Doo -doo 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 so there we have it. And so this is, so our range 799.44 uh, to 844. So we had a middle point of 822 and this is the range around it. What was the actual number? The actual population was 826. Is that within our range? It's within our range and we got 822 and then the range here at 95% confidence level. All right, let's try to do it another way we could say all right let's let's this time think of our our z for the upper bit so now we're, we're going to measure it in z's now which are basically in terms of standard deviations when we look at our graph so we can do that with this formula we're just going to take the norm uh, dot s dot inverse so we're taking that probability and saying give me using that probability give me the z position on the x-axis and it's going to be the 1.96 which makes sense because if i go back on over now we're saying we're saying if there's 95 percent in the middle five percent in the tails that means uh 2.5 in each of the sides of the tails I want to know this side, not in terms of X's, but in terms of Z's, which is almost two standard deviations, right? Because that's the generally rounding. You get about 95% in the middle for almost two standard deviations on either side, which is basically uh, what we are getting here. So that makes sense. We're going to say, all right, that makes sense. So we're going to say, so that gives us the 1.96. And then now based on that, we can calculate our uh, margin of error. And the margin of error is simply going to be then the standard, the standard uh, error, do, 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 which is going to be the standard deviation, standard error, 111.649. And then I'm going to multiply that times. There's 1.96 of them times 1.96. And that's going to give us the uh, range in terms of X's instead of Z's. So now I can use that to calculate the lower limit and upper limit, just taking the middle point in X's rather than in Z's. Remember, in Z's, the middle point would be zero. That's in standard deviations. In X's, we're saying that the average that we came out to was 822. We're measuring this graph around the result we got because of course we don't know the hypothesis test we don't know what the actual middle point is so we're doing confidence intervals so we're going to take that and say plus the 22.83 and i'm sorry i did the upper limit that gets to the 844.83 and if i take this middle point 822 minus then the minus the 22.83 that's going to give us the 799.17. So once again, we get the same range that we got up here with this method, which is one I tend to go to more often because I typically calculate this margin of error rather than norm using this norm.dist uh, calculation. But there's another formula we could use.
And this formula goes right to calculating the margin of error. So instead of us first calculating the Z and getting the margin of error, it's going to calculate the margin of error. So you got the confidence dot norm, and then it wants uh, the alpha. Now, this is a little confusing because you don't want the 2.5. It wants the full 5% here in order to calculate it if we were to use this method. And then we can say comma standard, the standard deviation, which is also funny because you would think that it would want the standard uh, the standard error, but it actually wants the standard deviation of the population. So it, it'll do the calculation itself for the, and then, it, and then uh, the standard DV. And so that's going to be this one. And that'll give us directly to the 2283, which gets us to the same point that I could take then the middle plus or minus the 2283 and then the middle or mean plus. And that's another way that we can get to these same two numbers. Okay, so then we could say, therefore, we are 95% sure that the population mean will be within this interval of the 799.17 and the 844.83. All right, so, so now what does it mean to be this 95%? That means that 5% of the time, uh, it might not land in there just by chance alone. And so let's actually test that out. We could say, okay, well, what if I, what if I uh, generate a bunch of, of random numbers using the same index uh, method that we did over here? So we had our actual population of 3,000 numbers. And then we used an index function to be picking up 300 numbers that are randomly generated from these numbers. Let's say I did that a bunch of times. So I'm going to say, I, now I have, how many times did I do that? I did that same exercise a hundred times. So now we have a hundred of them. Now, what would you expect then? You would expect then 95% of the time, the, re the average that we, the range that we get, the actual average should be within that range. But 5% of the time, it's not going to be in that range just by chance alone. So let's get an idea of, of what that means possibly more intuitively. So I can say, all right, let's take the mean of all of those. So this is just taking the average of each of these combinations. There's 100 of them, and we took the average of, of each of them. We got 816, 839, and so on and so forth. And then we took uh, the standard deviation of the sample of each of them, which we may or may not need. In the and then we took the N, which is 300. They're all samples of the same size of 300. And then we took the standard error. The standard error calculation, you will recall, is the, uh, is the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size n we get the same number all the way across because we're not using this standard deviation of the sample we're saying the standard deviation of the population was known therefore we're not using this this number but the known number we would use this number if we didn't know the standard deviation of the population confidence interval 95 percent all the way across that means alpha is going to be the five percent alpha divided by two is the 2.5. So then we're gonna calculate our, our range using the method that's the most straightforward. We'll just use the same method number one, same calculation to get the lower limit and the upper limit. So the, the point we wanna get across now is that 5% of the time, the actual number might not be within that range. So let's say that we, we said the actual here is 826. This is the actual mean of the actual data uh, if we took all 3,000 population. And you can see that this is in between, right? This is this is in between the range here. But if I go through here, that the T's mean that it's in between the, there. And by the way, if you want to test this out in Excel, we do these uh, uh, this test to make, we use the formatting in Excel to make it red or green and have it have show up as a T or not a T based on a logic test and so on. But the perp, the point is here, this one is at 826, which is on the margin. So you could say, well, it's still on the, mar on the range. Uh, 
but it's going it's getting to be outside of the range here right the rest are in between the range this one is outside of the range so it's at it's above the higher threshold and this one's outside the range it's above the high higher threshold here and so on so how many of them were above the range we could ask and we could say the trues that we got we got 97 of them and then the falses we got three of them so in this particular example we got three percent uh just by random lists alone where where the actual number is not found within our confidence interval and again you would expect if you repeated this infinitely many times you'd get five percent would not be found in the confidence interval because we have a confidence level of the 95 percent so that's something that we have to basically just be aware of now if we were to graph this thing we can graph it out i'm going to take these numbers which is our last uh sample of of uh the hundredth sample and we're going to be calculating the lower and upper x's this time based on four standard deviations why am i doing four standard deviations this time because I'm trying to make my graph so that it graphs the entire thing. Notice in later presentations, I'll start to do this by saying, first calculating the Z, so I can go four standard deviations out and then calculating the X, which will give me a very detailed graph. And that's kind of a, another way, a tactic you could use. But if I wanna see how far out the X's I need to go, you'll recall that 95% of the data is in two standard deviations almost 100% of the data is going to be within four standard deviations away. So if I was to take the, the standard error of 11.65 times four minus uh, the, the, the middle point, which is in this case 829, that's going to give us the 782. And if I was going to take the standard error 11.65 times four plus the middle point of 829, that's going to give us the 875. So then if I graph this thing, we can say, all right, let's graph it then. We're going to say that I'm going to have my X's go from 782 to about 875. I'm going to have them go up uh, one at a time here. I used a sequence function to do this in Excel. So I could take the, the latter number minus the starting number plus one. And then I want one column. And then the start point is going to be this starting point, 782. And the in, and the steps it's going to take is one number at a time. So you could do it that way, or you could just copy the numbers down. There's not too many of them. So either way is, a, is an effective method. And then we're taking our P of X, which is our norm.dist calculation. Norm.dist, the X is going to be this number. The mean is going to be the middle point that we calculated, and that's going to be the 829 in our case. And then the standard deviation is going to be the standard error calculation, 11.65. And then it's not cumulative, therefore a zero. And that will calculate and make, notice we made everything that's not in this area absolute with dollar signs. That's going to be calculating these numbers. And then we could calculate our Z's. Our Z's are calculated. That's so these numbers are calculating the X axis in X's, right? And then this is gonna be the X axis in Z's, which are basically in standard deviations. So I could convert each of these X's to a Z score by simply taking the X 782 minus the middle point 829 and then divided by the standard deviation standard error 11.65 and that's going to give us about the four here because we're rounded i believe so this one for example would be 783 minus the 829 divided by the standard error 11.65 and that gives us the 3.91 about. So that's going to give us our Z scores. And then this one will give us uh, the range, the orange bit, which is going to be between 806 and 852, because that's the range we got here, 806 and 852. So we said that 
that's going to contain 95% in the middle. So if I graphed this, I'm just graphing this as an area curve that gives me this whole graph. And then I'm graphing this bit, which you can see is the middle part. And that's going to be the 95% in the middle. And then we're graphing, uh, uh, and then I'm adding the Z down here. So we have it in Z's. So if I was to analyze this 95% in the middle, and then the endpoints here are in X's going to be at the 806 and the 856. So the 806 and then the 856 in Z's, the middle part is going to be zero. And then we should have the about two point, what did we say? 2.96 or something on each side. I mean, 1.96 or so, almost 2% on each side in Z's, right? to get to that to that central point. So that's going to be that's the general idea. So remember the difference with the confidence intervals are that instead of building the graph around the hypothesis, the given information and then taking our sample to see how far away it is from the middle point, we instead are building in essence our center point around the the sample that we got because we didn't know what the center point is and then make it a confidence interval around it. And if we can use the normal distributions, then we can use, you know, the normal distributions calculation, which we can typically do in a situation where we know what the standard deviation is and we have a fairly large uh, population and sample. But if we don't know what the standard deviation is and or possibly have a smaller standard deviation or sample, we might be able to then instead of using normal distributions, use T distributions, which are still bill shaped and use similar concepts, but have different graphs that are actually a little bit fatter on the tails. And that means, of course, if it's fatter on the tails, more of the area is going to be in the tails, which means in order to get the same 95% confidence level, you would have to widen out the range which makes sense if we have you know less information you do you would need a wider range for the same level of confidence